So one of the issues that has come up since the uh, rapid development in um, artificial intelligence technology that consumers can use um, since maybe the middle of 2022 with the release of DALL-E and other text image software, and then especially in late 2022 when ChatGPT and then later uh, GPT-4 were released, one of the big issues that a lot of people have been discussing is are people going to lose their jobs? Are illustrators, uh, computer programmers, uh, customer service representatives, are they going to be replaced by these new tools? Well, in this video, I want to talk um, a little case study of one profession that um, has been potentially affected by advances in artificial intelligence even before 2022, um, which is translation. So um, translation by machine started to become kind of feasible around 2016, 2017, when Google Translate suddenly got a lot better using uh, neural networks. Um, and um, translators started to be worried about it. It started to affect the translation business, but it wasn't so, it was such a big difference. But um, especially after GPT-4 was released um, uh, a little over a month ago, uh, it was... Um, it shows signs of intelligence, of, of, of comprehension, uh, that the previous versions of machine translation did not have. It seems to be able to understand meaning to some extent. And the heart of translation is not translating words, it's, it's translating the meaning between languages. So um, I am myself a former translator. I worked as a Japanese to English translator for 20 years. And um, I remained very interested in the field. One feature of the translation um, industry is that it's very diverse and scattered. There are, um, and so it's difficult to get a grasp on the whole industry. Um, um, and so rather than just talking about my own experience exclusively, I decided to have a little convocation of translators similar to me. Um, and so I, at the end of March, 2023, um, I held an online session for, um, well, I, could, I put, it out, put it out the word to all, anybody interested but um, especially focusing on translation between Japanese and English. Um, and so about 125 people signed up for the event. Um, 45 took part in it online, live. And then the video, which I made available to those who had registered, was um, has been watched by over 100 people um, since then. So I think there's a pretty big interest in it. Um, the majority of the participants were freelance translators working from Japanese to English. Okay, so keep that in mind. So there, are, there, are, there was quite a bit of variety among them, but on the other hand, there's also a lot of commonality. So their experience, their views, their thoughts will not represent the entire field of translation. But I hope it might give some, you know, some ideas about both how translation might be affected by these technological developments in the years ahead and other fields as well, too. So um, first of all, let me talk a little bit about the translation business, um, for those of you who don't aren't familiar with it. Um, first of all, it's, um, it's, it's mostly not literature. It's not translating novels. It's not translating movies. So the vast majority of the translation business, as far as I know, is, uh, is business related to some extent or government related to some extent. And so, um, it's, it's done for money, okay? And so it has, it's usually the text has some value that people, <laughs> makes people want to pay for it. And that's how the translators make their money, of course. Um, and so it's divided into a lot of different sort of subcategories, different kinds of groups. One of, one of the important characteristics of translation is the language pair. What language is it translating from? What language is it translating to? So any human has a very limited number of, of languages that the, a human knows, and most humans have only you know one or two or three or four languages that they know well enough to translate uh, professionally. Uh, many people like me and most of the people who took part in the session translate in only one direction. So I translated in uh, only from Japanese, which is my second language, into English, which is my first or native language. Um, I did not, I never work, worked the opposite way professionally because there were many native speakers of Japanese who could go the other direction and write better Japanese than I could. Okay. So, so the, and of course there are, there's, you know, there's Russian to French and, and German to Spanish and many, many, many different um, language pairs that are possible for translation. Another uh, big thing to think about, you know, in terms of the um, types of translation is the purpose of the translation. 
And so maybe to, to be very simple about it, you can talk about whether the translation job is motivated or paid for by the reader or by the writer. So what I mean by that is that a reader-driven translation is there's somebody who wants to be able to read a document in another language. They can't read that language, so they want to have that translated into a language that they can read. And then writer-driven translation, somebody has written or produced a document um, in maybe often their first language, and they want that to be translated into another language so that other people will read it. So there's a big difference between those, those two categories. So reader-driven translation often doesn't have to be so good. Okay, so it can be, often the person just wants to get the, the, the gist of the meaning. What is this patent about? What is this business letter about? I don't want to know in general what it is. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be polished. Okay, so that's a re often the, the rates, the prices for reader-driven translation are lower. On the other hand, writer-driven writer translation might have a purpose like to advertise something or to convince something to create a good impression on, on people in another language. So in that case, the quality of the writing in the target language has to be much better. And so often the rates, the prices are higher for those. So the people who took part in my um, I, online session in March 2023, I were, was obviously dominated by um, people who were using English as their first language, Japanese was their second language, and they were translating into English. So they were doing mainly writer-driven uh, translation, and that's the kind of translation that I also did. Um, another important thing to th think about um, for our discussion today about the translation industry is how translators work, the employment situation of translators. So I was freelance and most of the people who took in this event were took part in this event were freelance meaning that i'm not an, i was not an employee of any company or organization i worked on my own i would receive work from a variety of clients and they would pay me for the work and that's how i supported myself for 20 years um and so most of the people in this um particular event were freelance but there are also a lot of translators who um are often called in-house translators. There may be two types, main types of in-house translators. One would be translators who work in a private company. So for example, in the case of Japan, there are these large electronic companies and um, automobile companies and things like this. And so those companies have a lot of need for translation. Often the translation is quite specialized because it's related to the company's needs. Often it's confidential in the sense that it's about you know new business prospects and new technology. And so the companies are uh, want to have translators who both know the material well and who will keep their secrets. And so there will be translators who work inside those companies doing work for the companies. And so those translators typically receive a salary. Um, and then there are also um, translation agencies. I'll talk about those a little bit more, but there are translators who work within translation companies, language services companies, doing translation and editing translations. One more thing to keep in mind about translation for human translation is that it's a, it can be a very specialized field, specialized not only in the language, not only in the language direction, but in terms of the field. So many of the documents that need to be translated are extremely specialized. So they're patents on chemicals or their you know, financial reports or there are um, medical research papers and things like this. And so if, if you were to see one of these documents in a field you're not familiar with, even in your first language, you would be, you know, you'd, you'd be blown away. You wouldn't understand what it's about very often. And that requires a lot of specialized vocabulary and, and specialized knowledge in order to understand it. So many, maybe most uh, translators tend to specialize in a particular field like finance or maybe marketing and advertising or medical, pharmaceuticals. Some, there's people who specialize more in art, you know, the humanities, things like this. Business of many types is another sort of field. Patents has historically been a very big field for, for translation, though maybe it's one that's been hurt most by um, machine translation. And of course, information technology, um, computers. So. There are translators who call themselves generalist translators. I tended to be generalist, um, in, in, but um, I did a lot of different subjects, but I, I recognize the, the value and the importance of, of specializing. It can be really hard to translate a document in a field you're not specialized in. So keep, but keep all these things in mind. The fact that we have a lot of different language pairs, different directions, the purposes of the translation can be very different. 
people might be working freelance, in which case they're not, they don't have a lot of contact with other translators and it's not possible to really know about their business situations from the outside. So that's why even, I'm going to try to draw some generalizations at the end of this video, but I don't, I think we should be careful about how much we generalize about this field based on what, what I tell you. Um, so even before um, the advances in large language models, um, first chat GPT, then GPT-4, um, uh, machine translation was already getting better, okay? And so it, it had been around for quite a while, but beginning around 2016, 2017, it, it started getting good enough so it could be used in some purposes. And because, of course, computers are so much cheaper than humans, or the, the, the product, text produced by computers is so much cheaper than the text translated by humans, um, customers, transla clients, translation agencies were, were starting to adopt machine translation more and more beginning around 2017. Um, and they often went, went about in a two-step process. So there was a pre-editing process where, uh, for example, a, a, somebody who was maybe not a translator, but somebody who was sensitive to the issues of translation would first read the text in the source language and modify it in ways to make it easier to translate, make the vocabulary more regular, um, add, you know, make the subjects of sentences obvious, clear, a variety of, of, of different um, adaptations they could do. And then they would run that translation through the machine, and then the, the uh, post-editor would read that and fix the results, okay? Um, and that was, is, it could be used for some types of translation, especially for reader-driven translation. You could get a good enough translation of a, you know, often of a, patent technical documents where you didn't really know, had need to know precisely what it means, but you need to know the general gist of it. That would work pretty well. It didn't really work very well for advertising, marketing, things like that. Okay. But then now we have this, these new lang large language models that are more, much more sensitive to meaning. They're much more flexible in the sense you can give a variety of prompts to them and they respond in prompts in different ways. They can do things like paraphrasing, you know, rewriting paragraphs, suggesting different words, different language, different expressions for things. And, um, and so, and they obviously have a lot of potential in other ways as well too. You know, some people are saying that they show signs of intelligence. Um, that's, that's of course a controversial point, but it is true that they're much more powerful than the previous dedicated systems. And so, um, I asked these translators um, what they thought of them and how are they, are they using them? And what do they think about them, first of all, as tools, um, the, especially GPT-4, and what, what do they think the effects on their, on their careers might be? So um, surprisingly to me, um, among the you know, 40 or 50 or 60 translators who gathered for that online session, not that many had actually tried it yet. I had asked them all in an email a couple of weeks in advance to, you know, try it out so, so that we can discuss it based on, on our knowledge of it. But most of them had not had, they'd been, they were busy with work, which is good, but they hadn't actually tried it yet. But those who had been using it said they were starting to use it, you know, productively to help them with their work. Um, one way was to do a first draft. I've used it this way myself as well, too, translating from Japanese to English. So rather than, the hardest part of translation is reading that text and writing the first draft into the other language. In Japanese and English, the sentences have a very, very different structure, and so you really have to kind of spend some time sometime with each sentence to, to kind of parse the structure and to, to put that into, into English, in my case. And so the GPT-4 does that in an in a, in a, in a instant. And then you check it and you improve it and you make changes to it. And then that, in my case, that saves a lot of time. So there are some translators who are starting to do that to, to save time. Um, they had some uh, concerns about it as well though. So what, with them, not only GPT-4, but um, uh, other, you know, other types of machine translation, they kind of felt it, it hurt their, their creativity. So some, some would use it when they were at a loss. What, what, what's the best expression here? What, what should, how should I say this in the other language? And so they would um, get a translation from machine translation that was good enough, but they felt it, was, it didn't really have the personality that they wanted it to have. And so um, that's something to keep in mind. That's why when I get to the end of this video, I will return to that topic again. Um, well, what, one of the things that they, they, we were concerned about, that we were thinking about, is to what extent can um, these tools 
both regular machine translation and GPTs be used um, by people who are not bilingual, okay? So in other words, people who do not know the source language. And so some of the people who took part in this, in this event were, were not really translators, but were editors. And so they would, w one gentleman was, said he was worked in the medical field and he often started with documents that had written by, by Japanese doctors, uh, research papers and things like that. And they had written it in English and then he would rewrite it and fix it and repair it and consult with the authors about that. And um, people like that apparently can, you know, can use this tool um, effectively in the sense that if they don't really, aren't able to read the Japanese, either because they're not so fluent in reading the language or because they, um, they, 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 it's too technical, it's too, but they can get a, they can, if there's something they're not sure about in the Japanese, in the English that was written by a native Japanese speaker, they can run it through the, the translation engines and get, get one translation or more than one different translation, often figure out what, what it was supposed to be about, and then prepare a, a good, smooth, correct English version of that. Um, so the, the, it was, some people were using it, you know, um, productively, they said. And so that raises an issue, of course, okay? So if a translator can use it to save time, and if it's, if it, for some types of translation, it might save a lot of time, well, that is a, is, has a very strong potential of driving down prices, okay? So the translation agencies and the clients who, 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 who send work to, to agencies will, will think, well, maybe we, I shouldn't be paying so much money, or that, of course, there will be suppliers of translation services entering the market, offering, providing good, reasonably good um, services, and the prices are much lower. Um, and so this come, brings to mind, um, well, what, what's going to be the effect on, on, on uh, the, their careers of translators? So there's one more aspect of the, of the um, translation industry, uh, translation as careers that I want to talk about, is um, when a freelancer when a freelance translator gets work, how does the work come to them? And it was very interesting with this survey I did of, of the translators. There were 50 or so freelancers, I think, um, the people I surveyed. And I asked them, do you get most of your work from directly from your clients? Also from a company or a government agency. Do you work for direct clients? Do you get most of your work from a translation agency? So a translation agency is uh, a company that, you know, a, somebody who needs a translation done will contact the agency, will send it to the work to the agency, and the agency then takes that manuscript and sends it to uh, one or more translators. Okay. And then when the translation comes, the translation agency presumably checks it and sends it to the client. And um, about one third of the people I surveyed in this, in this event, the Japanese English translators, did most of their work for um, uh, direct clients. They got the work directly from their clients. Uh, about one third of them got it mostly from, from agencies. And there was one third that had a mix of both of them. So let me, um, what's the difference from the translator's point of view and also from the client's point of view? What's, what's the difference between working directly between the client and the, and the translator and what's working through an agency? Well, um, first of all, the agency very naturally takes a big chunk of the fee. So I, I don't know, actually, I think freelance translators, I think often don't know how much their, their agencies are charging their direct clients. But I think it's often around, they take about 50%. Um, it probably varies a lot depending on the nature of the work and the nature of the, of the, of the client. But, you know, so if somebody pays, it, it, the client is paying $1,000 for this translation, the, the translator might receive 500 of that. Um, and so from the, it's, from the translator's point of view, it seems as though it would be better to work for direct clients. But on the other hand, um, agencies are often more reliable at providing work. So direct clients, their needs come and go. And it's also harder to get work from a direct client. You have to have some kind of connection or somehow. Um, another thing is that some, many translation jobs are, are huge. Okay, so you imagine a, you know, there's a company that is opening a factory in another, in another country. And so they need all of the documents related to that factory, all of the um, operating instructions for the machines and the training materials for the employees and all kinds of stuff. So thousands and thousands of pages has to be translated into the language of that country. Well, no 
human translator working by themselves without <laughs> without machine translation, translating by themselves. No, nobody can do that on their own. So a translation agency in that case serves a very, very valuable function of taking those documents, finding out what vocab the vocabulary that is consistent, making sure the vocabulary is consistent in them, farming out to a group of, of translators, and then working with those translators to make sure that the translations are consistent and, and coherent and, and valuable and serve the needs of the client. And so, so there, there are some translators who prefer working for agencies. Um, but one of the features of working for agencies, which is also important for the conclusion of this video, is that um, there is often no contact between the, the a translator and the client. Okay, so the agencies don't want the translators to be in touch with the clients because they, they're afraid that they'll steal work from them often. And also, and so, so if a translator has a question about the document, or if the client has a question about the, about the translation, it goes through the agency. And so it's often not very difficult for the translator and the agency to talk to each other. Um, and so one of the advantages of direct client translation, especially for writer-driven um, translation, is that the translator can you know, negotiate and to talk about the, what, what, what do you need, what are you trying to say here if they don't understand something? Or what's the, what's the real purpose of this document? Do you really want to say this? Maybe you want to say something else. And so they, there's, there's more, more room for negotiation between those, between the two. And so, um, let's, so we'll, what, what, what is, <laughs> what is it going to be the effect on, on careers? Well, before I held this event, one, one translator emailed me um, with his own thoughts about GPT-4 and translation. Uh, he was a Japanese English translator. And his view that uh, the quality, first of all, the quality of the translation from GPT, he felt, was, was uh, within the range of the top 30% of professional translators. In other words, it was better than 70%. Of, of human translators, okay? And so he was quite pessimistic about whether it would, um, whether human translators in general had much hope for surviving into the future. The people in the event, who took part in the event live were, uh, well, there were a lot of, quite mixed opinions about it, but there were a lot of people who felt that they would be able to adapt and that translators would be able to adapt. And so they, they, the things that they, they, they said was that um, well, one thing that not only, if you're not only just translating, you're not just producing a text that tries to represent the meaning of the original text, but you're also editing it. So you're also write, rewriting it and, and improving it and polishing it for the, uh, some particular purpose. Well, they, they feel that that is something that will be more difficult, even for these very smart AIs to do, to, to negotiate with the client, decide what, is, what the client's needs are, and also to have a sense for the nuance of the language. How will the reader, the human reader, respond to this? Well, there's a feeling that maybe the human editors are better at that. So one of the comments that some of the people said, they thought that um, good writing skills for translators. Translators always have to be good writers. You have to be a careful writer, a skilled writer to do translation. But those writing skills will be even, even more important. Um, but there was also there was also a view of that um, which I tended to agree with as well too that translators who rely on a agency work so they're they're at a distance from the clients um, and there's this agency that they're receiving money from that agency of course is trying to maximize their own their own profit and so the agency will be looking for anything that they can do to to save money save costs while still providing a good enough service to their clients, their customers. And so um, if these uh, translation driven by large language models is able to be used to produce good, uh, as good translation or close to as good translation as a human translation um, by, their, by their translators, then they will do that because it will be much cheaper than, than a human uh, translated thing. So there were... Um, among the people I talked to, as you might have expected, they were both sort of pessimists and optimists about both these large language models in translation and about artificial intelligence in general. So there are, within the, especially within the last um, few months, there's been a lot of talk about, well, this, we're now at the singularity where you know, humans are being driven out of work, the, the, the pace of 
development of machine tr of of large language models and artificial intelligence is accelerating. Artificial intelligence will be used to make artificial intelligence even better, faster. And so um, there, some of the people taking part, some of these translators who've been following that were quite pessimistic about that. Others were um, take the position that there are certain types of you know, skills and thinking and feeling that only humans have, that humans continue to have a unique uh, perspective and unique view that um, machines cannot replace. Okay, I tend to be on the pessimistic side of things, um, especially regarding the, the, the extent to which the translation is done facelessly. So what I mean by that, um, if, you, if you've read, trans, you've, you have all read translations, but often not realizing it, you bought a product from, you know, from a foreign country that has a, uh, has a, um, instruction manual, maybe in several different languages, right? You can buy these electronic products that sometimes they have instructions in, in 10 or 15 languages in a little folded up piece of paper in there. Well, somebody translated all those things. And um, have you ever seen the name or the face of the translator of those? Probably not. Okay, so so most translation is done facelessly, and so the customer doesn't care who the translator is. They just want to read it. They just want to read it, and they hope that the translation is good and correct. And so that's... Um, I think that kind of translation, the translation where the human element is, is not visible to the reader or to the customer, is the one that's most at risk because the quality of some of these new tools is really, really good. And in some ways they make fewer mistakes than the human translators do. And it was gonna be a lot cheaper, okay? But on the other hand, in the cases where the human is visible, um, you know, so this is the translator of this famous author. So there's a famous author that people like to read. And you've seen this, the translator's face appears on the back of the book. And the translator appears in podcasts and on the tube, on the, on the internet talking about the translation process. And so the, in that case, the, I think there will be a lot of people who will continue to buy that human done translation because they know that who the translator is. So, um, and then the other element is, um, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that um, if there's a human translator who can interact directly with the client, who can work together with to solve the client's problems, often the client's problems are not only that they have a document they need to have to translated. The, often the client is trying to do business in another country or is trying to do some international negotiation with other people, is trying to share a country's culture with people in other countries. And... You, usually those clients are not very sophisticated about language. They don't really understand how their, the message that they want to say will be perceived by people in different linguistic communities. And so somebody who has both bilingual and bicultural skills and who's sensitive to um, how different messages are conveyed in different um, languages and in different um, countries and in different contexts, um, somebody like that can, can provide valuable advice and, and, and consultation to those people. So I, I see, uh, to think about a, a parallel situation, a parallel case of the issue for the translation as a career is software developers. So especially since GPT-4 came out, um, there have been a lot of debates that I've seen online among programmers, software developers, are we gonna lose our jobs? Because you can ask GPT-4 to write a program and it's pretty good. I mean, sometimes it has to be fixed, but a lot of experienced programmers are reporting that it speeds up their coding time a lot for certain types of programming, five times, 10 times faster. Um, and so they're saying, are we, are we gonna lose our jobs? And so s some people are worried about it. There's some programmers who seem to be worried about it. There are others who, or no, well, they say, oh, no, my job as a software developer only, you know, only 10% of my time is spent coding. 90% of my time is understanding the problem, discussing it with the clients, um, working with users, showing, you know, developing a user interface that, is, that is, is understandable to the users. There's all this human interactive element that is involved in software um, development that they say is the most important part. And so that coding is just a little bit. And so if, if you imagine tra if translation is, if you think about translation like that, well, there are, more, especially writer-driven translation, often has that, that those, other, those elements beyond the text itself. There's often, there are often very, very good translations that don't serve their purpose at all, and that the, that the client should be advised by somebody. 
So um, I think in that sense, the sense, well, the first is a sense of a tra the case where the translator is visible, has sort of a brand value as a human being. That's one way translators can protect their jobs. The other way is the translators protect their jobs by, you know, interacting with clients, by solving problems, by being more complex, less deterministic in their work that they do. So one, one issue in this regard that is, I think, common for both programmers and translators is there are a lot of people who go into programming and go into translation or who stay in, the, in those careers is that they like working by themselves sitting in front of a computer and they don't, don't like having a boss. They don't like going attending meetings. They like solve, working on these problems. Translation is a, a kind of a problem. It's a, it's a puzzle. It's just like programming can be kind of a puzzle that you're working on. And I, uh, my feeling, it probably for both cases, the people who have that kind of personality, which, by the way, when I was younger, I think that was one of the big attractions for translation for me, was just working by myself at home um, with these, these, these intellectual puzzles of translation I had to do every day. Unfortunately, I think that's the kind of work that is most likely to be, to be harmed by these advances. And so to the extent that people like me when I was young or some other, you know, many software coders and people like that, who to the extent that people can adapt and, and learn more, you know, flexible skills, more human skills, more interactive skills, then I think there, there's more, uh, more possibility. Okay, another thing that's common in the debate between about translation and um, programming is that in both people in, in, in both fields have made the point that there's a huge amount of work that has not been done, okay? So there are all kinds of software that could be developed that is necessary and is needed, but just it's too expensive to develop. Nobody's been developing it, okay? So maybe if we have these tools, it won't reduce the jobs for the number of, of programmers. There'll just be a lot more programming done, and the programmers will use these tools to produce a more, more, more... Um, Software. The same thing can I think can apply to translation as well too. There's a, a, a amount of documents that could be translated that should be translated that are not translated is huge. Okay, and so in that case, the probably in both cases, in the case of the programmers and the case of the of the translators, if you want to keep working in that field or something close to that field, well, you need to learn about these tools and you need to be able to to learn, learn about the tools as they're advancing very quickly and adopt them and use them and develop your own skills and your own, your own um, personal talents to meet this new age that we're, we're, we're coming into. So whether, the, you know, I don't, whether translation as a career is going to end is, is, is too early to say, but I think it seems like that certain types of translation, the translation where the trans, translator is faceless, is invisible, and is separated from the from the pur purpose or the use of the translation. That's the one where it's most risky. But on the other hand, the case where the translator is helping people communicate across linguistic, cultural, national boundaries, um, and using their their knowledge of languages and their sophistication about language to help people solve learn how to solve problems across those boundaries. Well, then there is more hope for at least the, the short term and the midterm. What's going to happen in the long term with these developments of artificial intelligence? Um, I would not like to predict because I would very likely be wrong, whatever I predict. So um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I will come back again when I have something else to say and make another video. So thank you all very much.